Well, good afternoon, brothers and sisters, my dear church family. It's uh, 21 April, 2020, day umpteenth of Groundhog Day with the coronavirus. Uh, but it is a beautiful day outside. Can't wait to get out there, walk the dog, hoe the garden, and generally enjoy this beautiful weather that the Lord has given us. Uh, today is a very special day for me because uh, my dear bride is uh, this is her birthday today. Yeah, she's not here with us right now. She's out running errands for some other folks, which is typically uh, what she does uh, with her servant's heart. And um, she'll have to catch up with us later on. But uh, this is her birthday today. So if you will send up a, a prayer of thanks for her, for her birthday, I know she would be moved to... Um, to know that you've prayed for her today. Um, yesterday, Pastor Jordan focused his devotion on Psalm 110, and he noted how Psalm 110 is um, heavily quoted in the New Testament, and particularly in Hebrews. And Lord, I, uh, Brother Jordan, I really appreciate your message yesterday. Well done, brother. Uh, today, I'll be focusing on a psalm that is not referenced in the New Testament at all. Uh, it's kind of interesting. Uh, although it is never quoted in the New Testament, though, it contains lessons that are as relevant to the church today as for those of Israel. Uh, we'll be looking at Psalm 81 today. Uh, so if you go ahead and turn to it in uh, your Bible and we'll be prepared to read. Uh, there are aspects and features of this psalm that are truly remarkable. Uh, the significance of this psalm and the message contained with it cannot be overstated. Composed of only 16 verses, it is a relatively short psalm. Nevertheless, uh, one can spend a lot of time on exegesis, uh, determining its meaning of this song, psalm. Uh, I certainly don't want to do that. Uh, I try to keep uh, this one, this devotional, to 15 minutes or so. Uh, I'm not going to make any promises because there is so much in this psalm that excites me that I wanted to get to you. But I'll do my best to try to keep it to 15 minutes. Uh, prom probably a go 20, to be honest, but we'll see. But let's start off by reading the psalm, if you're ready. Uh, it is Psalm 81. It is entitled in my Bible, uh, and the ESV, Oh, that my people would listen to me. It has a superscription to the choir master, according to the Getith, that is Getith of Asaph. In verse 1, Sing aloud to God our strength. Shout for joy to the God of Jacob. Raise a song, sound the tambourine, the sweet lyre with the harp. Blow the trumpet at the new moon, at the full moon, on our feast day. For it is a statute for Israel, a rule of the God of Jacob. He made it a decree in Joseph, Joseph when he went out over the land of Egypt. I hear a language I had not known. I relieved your shoulder of the burden, your hands were freed from the basket. In distress you called, and I delivered you. I answered you in the secret place of thunder. I tested you at the waters of Mirabah, Shelah. Hear, O my people, while I admonish you. O Israel, if you would but listen to me. There shall be no strange God among you. You shall not bow down to a foreign God. I am the Lord your God, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide, and I will fill it. But my people did not listen to my voice. Israel would not submit to me. So I gave them over to their stubborn hearts to follow their own counsels. Oh, that my people would listen to me, that Israel would walk in my ways. I would soon subdue their enemies and turn my hand against their foes. Those who hate the Lord would cringe toward him and their fate would last forever. But he would feed you with the finest of wheat, and with, the, with honey from the rock I would satisfy you. Lord, bless the reading of your word. Ah, this is a great psalm. There's a lot going on here. We don't know when this psalm was written, uh, though the superscription to the choir master, according to the Gedith of Asaph, suggests that it was written during the reign of David. There are three men uh, mentioned in the Old Testament by the name of Asaph. And one of them was a Levite, the son of Berechiah, one of the leaders of David's choir. There are 12 psalms that are attributed to him, uh, Psalm 50 and Psalm 70 through 
73 through 83. Yet there is a problem with describing this psalm or Psalm 74 to the son of Berechiah. Uh, as W. Robert Godfrey notes, Psalm 73 through 89 constitute the third book of the five books of the Psalms. And these, this book, book three, principally concerns the crisis in Israel caused by the destruction of the temple. That's really the focus of Psalm 74. And the apparent failure of God's promises that David's sons would forever sit on his throne. That's in Psalm 89. Thus, these are events that occur well after the reign of King David. First with the uh, fall of Israel to the Assyrians and subsequently the fall of Judah to the Babylonians. Um, 80, Psalm 81 that we're looking at today certainly it places itself in a time of great turmoil and, uh, and, and pressure upon the nation of Israel. So you have to wonder, was this, this Asaph, did he actually live during the time of King David or was he more, uh, did he live during the uh, time of Hezekiah or thereafter during the, the uh, exile, post-exile uh, exile period? We don't know for sure. Irrespective. This is, it is quite literally the centerpiece of the Psalms. For no other reason, this Psalm is of importance. Now think about that. Psalm 81 is the centerpiece of the Psalms. Just as I mentioned, there are five books within the overall book of Psalms. Psalm 81 is in book three, which of course, book three is between the first two books, one and two, and the last two books, four and five. So book three is the center of the book of Psalms. And as I mentioned, uh, book three is composed of Psalms 73 through 89, 17 Psalms in total. So which Psalm is it right in the middle of that distribution of 17? Psalm 81. It's in the center, lying between the first Psalm, the first eight Psalms 73 through 80, and the last eight Psalms, Psalms 82 through 89. That's pretty extraordinary. Ah, but it gets better. As one studies the Psalms, one learns that the central verse of a psalm is often the significant key to interpretation of the psalm. That's no less true of 81. The central line of Psalm 81 is the heart of the psalm, and it's an amazing one. It's found in the second half of verse 8. Uh, call it verse 8b, which reads, O Israel, if you would but listen to me. That is the hinge upon which the entire Psalms uh, rests. As scholar and author and teacher w. God, Robert Godfrey states, this line then is the central line or theme of the whole book of the Psalms. It stands at the very heart of Israel's songbook. End of quote. This line reflects the Shema, which is, the, is central to the Torah itself. At the heart of the Mosaic Covenant in De Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4 and 5, God had commanded his people, and listen to, the, to these words, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Hey, that's one of our memory verses. Love it. This is the Shema. Israel was commanded to hear and enjoined to love God with all their heart, soul, and might. In doing so, they would meet the object of the entire sacrificial system established in the Mosaic Covenant, to be a cleansed and a holy people living to glorify a holy God, a nation of priests, as it were. Here in the central verse of the book of Psalms, God is plaintively crying out to Israel, admonishing them, with the refrain, O oh, Israel, if you would but listen to me. It calls Israel to a deep reflection on her relationship to God. Indeed, to a reflect upon their failure to live in a right covenantal relationship with God. That's pretty astonishing. Let's look at some detail of Psalm 81. This psalm is more specific than any than many of the psalms about the original occasion for its composition. The psalmist tells us why this psalm was composed. 
The formal occasion of writing this psalm was to celebrate a season of important religious festivals in Israel. For it says in verse 3, Blow the trumpet at the new moon and at the full moon on our feast day. There's only one month on the Hebrew calendar where you have feast days both on the new moon and on the full moon. That's in the seventh month of the year, Tishri in the Hebrew calendar. Do we find these holy days? The festivals of this month, which on our Gregorian calendar covers September through October, uh, is a complex of festivals beginning with uh, the Jewish New Year festival, that's Rosh Hashanah, on the first day of the month, followed by the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, on the tenth day, and the Feast of Tabernacles, Sukkoth, or Sukkot, on the fifteenth. In this complex of uh, festivals, we see Israel called to reflect on God's great mercy and care for her. And we see Israel called to remember and repent of her sins. Now, that's important for us to do quite often, to remember what we once were and who we are now. Psalm 81 renews God's people to his people to listen to his proclamation of truth. We should ask, for what it was Israel to listen. Godfrey notes three words from the Lord that Israel was to hear. First, Israel needed to hear God's word of deliverance. This psalm calls on Israel in very personal terms and very directly to remember how their God had delivered them in the past. You see this in verses 6, 7, and 10a. Where it says, I relieved your shoulder of the burden. Your hands were freed from the basket. In distress, you called and I delivered you. I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. God had heard his people's prayers and saved them in the past from their slavery in Egypt. God also reminds his people that he can deliver them in the future. Verse 14 conveys this. I would soon subdue their enemies and turn my hand against their foes. What God has done for his people in the past, he can do again. I think these words are important for us too. God's words of deliverance. We should reflect upon, as I said, who we once were. We were dead in our sins. Yet God delivered us from them. And we should remember that. Never lose sight of that. And we should rejoice in the fact of our salvation and in the process of sanctification that God has worked, is working in our lives. Second, Godfrey notes the word of deliverance is accompanied with the word of direction. God reminds his people that they must listen to him. Verse 4 reminds the people that he, God, has given them his law and they must heed it. In addition to the call in verse 8, God says, Quote, but my people would not listen to my voice. Israel would not submit to me. Oh, that my people would listen to me, that Israel would walk in my ways. This is awfully sad. As is often the case in the Old Testament, God focuses on the way many, you know, on the many ways in which Israel fell and fell, failed to listen to him in the central issue of worship. Here, after calling his people to worship him, in verses 1 through 3, God warns against false worship. There shall be no strange God among you. You shall not bow down to a foreign God. Uh, As I'll cover in a few minutes, that admonition applies to us as well. The words of deliverance and of direction, according to Godfrey, lead to a word of destruction. He put a lot of work into coming up framing this with the three Ds. God warns his people that he can and will judge his enemies. I would soon subdue the enemies and turn my hand against their foes. Those who hate the Lord would cringe towards him and their fate would last forever. His people are warned implicitly, not explicitly, but implicitly, they should listen to these words because it applies to them too that they should not be numbered among those who oppose God. This psalm is clear that despite all the calls to listen, listen, both in this psalm and throughout her history, 
Israel has not listened. She has not followed the law of God, and she has not kept her worship pure. The people have preferred their own wisdom to that of God. So what does God do? So I gave them over to their stubborn hearts to follow their own counsels. These words are particularly ironic in the midst of feasts that remembered and celebrated how God delivered them from Egypt. Time and again, the people made foolish choices in the wilderness, including actually wanting to return to the bondage of Egypt rather than listening to the wisdom of their God. The crisis of Book 3 of the Psalter is a crisis provoked by the people's not listening. Because they have not listened, God has taken away their king, their temple, and their land. And they now are in bondage in Babylon. But God has not utterly abandoned them. He still declares in this psalm that if they will listen, he will bless them. But is this promise really encouraging? If Israel has not listened in the past, despite all of God's mercy and goodness to them, Will they ever listen? Psalm 81 begins with the words, Sing aloud to God our strength. Yes, God is our strength. But it is evident throughout the Old Testament that Israel is incapable of abiding in the covenant relationship with God in their own strength. That's true of us too. It is evident that God must be the strength of his people when they are weak. He, God, will be their strength when he comes in his Messiah King. And the entire Old Testament points to the coming of that person, the Messiah King. Who is that King? Well, we know. Jesus is the King who always listened and always will do the will of God. He and he alone has the strength to meet and fulfill the law. Hebrews 10 verses 5 and 7 Quote Psalms 40, verses 6 and 8. That's a psalm of David. And it applies it to Jesus, where it says, quote, Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. End of quote. At the transfiguration of Jesus, the Father declared, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. The Father in this place at the transfiguration also said to Jesus' disciples, uh, get this, listen to him. That is, listen to the good news that he brings for sinners. What's this mean to us? Godfrey observes Jesus rejected the three temptations of evil, of the evil one, of Satan, that Israel had failed to resist in Psalm 78. Here in Psalm 81, we again find echoes of those temptations and of the blessings God has promised to those who are faithful to him. First, God promises to give his people the bread they need. But he would feed you with the finest of wheat and with honey from the rock, I would satisfy you. Second, God promises to preserve and protect his people who do not put him to the test. In distress you called and I delivered you. I answered you in the secret place of thunder. I tested you at the waters of Mirabah. Third, God promises abundant blessing to those who worship him alone. There shall be no strange God among you. You shall not bow down to a foreign God. I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide and I will fill it. That's a wonderful phrase. Open your mouth wide and I fill it. Jesus, the righteous king, keeps the law perfectly for his people and has become the substitute and sacrifice for them and for us. He fulfills the day of atonement by offering himself as the full and final sacrifice for his people. Jesus is the solution to the crisis of the book of three. He is the one who listened, obeyed, died, and now forever lives for us. In Psalm 81, God reminds Israel he has always been their deliverer. I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt and would continue to provide for their needs 
open your mouth wide and I will fill it. This promise of the Lord applies to us as well. He promises that when we open our mouths in prayer, he will hear us and meet our needs. He is the God who preserves and provides for the needs of his own. As the Shema was crucial to the Torah, so it is central to the Psalter and to the Christian life. God's people must hear his word particularly to reject false gods. And as D.A. Carson writes, these false gods change from age to age. And our age, their money and fame, success, power, the trust in the political system of, of a political party, these are all false gods. We should not follow them. Rather, we should be prepared to walk in his ways. Moreover, we must not fall into the temptation to follow our own wisdom. Rather, we must abide in the Lord and humbly submit to his will. It is only in the Lord Jesus Christ that we can avoid the tragedies and sadness that abounds when we follow our own counsel. Trust me, been there, done that, suffered it. We are covered by his righteousness. Jesus always heard and honored God's word. His father delighted him, delighted in him for that reason. This is my beloved son, who I am well pleased. Jesus perfectly listened and followed that his people would have a complete and perfect salvation. The father continues to call to his people, us, to listen, now directing them to the words of his son. Listen to him. The salvation and health of the church depend on con- Continuing to listen to God's word. God says to us today, as he said to Israel of old and to every generation of his, of his people, O Israel, if you would but listen to me. Let us pray that the Holy Spirit will open ears in our churches and throughout our land. And let us listen carefully and believingly. Such listening is what we individually and the church collectively must do today. It's what we most need. So let us take a few moments and let's pray through this psalm. I was reflecting on it last night. In fact, I prayed this song last night, psalm last night. It's, it's a powerful prayer. So let's pray through it. Father God, hear our prayers to you today, Lord, in your own words. Sing aloud to God our strength. Shout for joy to the God of Jacob. Lord, we thank you for being our strength, our fortress, and our refuge. Raise a song, sound the tambourine, the sweet lyre with the harp. Let us continuously have a song of praise in our hearts and upon our lips to you, O God. Let us remember with thanksgiving and reflect with all humility upon your many blessings you have bestowed upon us. Blow the trumpet at the new moon, at the full moon on our feast day. Yes, Lord, may we shout for joy for the grace and mercy you have shown us at the new moon, at the full moon, and every day in between, month to month, year to year, all the days of our lives. For it is a statute for Israel, a rule of the God of Jacob. He made it a decree in Joseph when he went out over the land of Egypt. I hear a language I had not known. I relieved your shoulder of the burden. Your hands were freed from the basket. And distress you called, and I delivered you. I answered you in the secret place of thunder. I tested you at the waters of Meribah, Shalah. Above all, merciful Father, let us remember and rejoice in the salvation you have given us. Purchase at an unfathomable cost through the sacrifice of your son, Jesus Christ, on that cruel cross at Calvary. Let us remember that we were dead in our trespasses against you, yet now our sins are crucified with Christ, and we now have life through our resurrected Lord. Hear, O people, while I admonish you. O Israel, if you would but listen to me. Lord, let us always abide in your word and be attentive to the leading of your Holy Spirit. We seek only to do your will all the days of our lives. Let the fruit of the Holy Spirit abound in us. There shall be no strange God among you. You shall not bow down to a foreign God. 
O Lord, let us put away all trust in the things of this fallen world. Let us not return to Egypt. Give us the strength to avoid the temptation of the poisonous siren calls of the false gods of this world. I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide and I will fill it. But my people do, did not listen to my voice. Israel would not submit to me. Help us, Lord, not to be a stiff-necked and hard-hearted people. Rather, help us to, be, to humbly submit to you and to do the work that our Lord Jesus Christ has called us to do. So I gave them over to their stubborn hearts to follow their own counsels. Lord God, let that not be us. Help us, Lord, to not fall into the temptation to rely on our own strength or our own counsel. For these are folly and foolishness. Only in you can we endure and finish the race well. Oh, that my people would listen to me, that Israel would walk in my ways. I would soon subdue their enemies and turn my hand against their foes. Those who hate the Lord would cringe towards him and their fate would last forever. But he would feed you with the finest of wheat and with the honey from the rock I would satisfy you. Lord, we trust in you and pray that your will be done in the lives of your people. We especially pray that you sustain those among us who are ill and infirm, that are hurting in spirit and who are in difficult circumstances today. We know you are faithful to hear our prayers and you are sovereign over all creation, that everything has made good by your power and wisdom. You are our strength, you are our fortress, you are our refuge. Keep us, O Lord, on the path of righteousness for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, folks, for joining me today. I certainly enjoyed bringing this devotion to you. Um, Brother Jordan said that I almost mentioned my age, but that's okay. I'm 63, uh, and I ain't married an older woman, so I'll leave you with that. And um, Karen is not uh, here yet. When she watches this later, she'll kill me. Uh, so y'all remember me in your prayers, and just remember, absent the body, I'll be with the Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. I give y'all, uh, pray for y'all a good day, a blessed day in the Lord. See you later.